Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs>
like pressing, you know, it's like you said, the tiny little fine tuning at the last minute, just like yeah. little polish here and there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just before you it kind of, it goes out there live and you realize there's a massive spelling mistake in the title or something <laughs> like that, something magical like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's all these wonderful things. Having Rumble and Kickstarter, I'm aware it's the, the first time I've actually ever checked anything really really seriously because i knew i was asking people for money so who knew mm -hmm. um how did you how did you get involved in the hobby in the first place because we like to find out about people's history so we want to look at i don't know the really big doll of the past and then open it up to find out the middle sized doll in the middle and then open that up to find you know the annoying peg one that isn't really painted that well, just looks a the bit one that fakes you, like, you out, and you're like, "That's it." Yeah. Mm -hmm. The disappointment. There's a little the disappointment. disappointment doll inside me somewhere. <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna figure out which one of me it is. <laughs> How did you get involved in the hobby? All right. Um, I used right. to have friends who played. Magic the Gathering, and so I learned about there were things beyond Monopoly from that, but I, I'd never let it stick. Magic the Gathering's a hobby in and of itself, I think. And I started actually watching Star Trek Next Generation. Oh, okay. And I was curious oh, okay. what Will Wheaton was up to after seeing him on Star Trek, and so I found out about his show Tabletop, and it was really entertaining and those games just looked great. And so I started watching tabletop and they had their first international tabletop day. And I found out that my local comic store was participating doing games. And so I went mm -hmm. and that was pretty much where it started because I played games that I never played before. And the first one I played was ticket to ride. I think that's, um, Ticket to, I asked a handful of people what their first game was a few weeks ago, and a lot of answers were Ticket to Ride, um, Catan, Carcassonne. And so Ticket to Ride was my first, I guess, modern classic into the industry. And I just started playing games. Made some friends, and they made me play more games, and I liked them. <laughs> what kind of got you away from Magic the Gathering? I mean, was it, is it quite, because I've looked at Magic, I've got a really funny story about Magic the Gathering, by the way, that happened like the other day, but I'll maybe tell it later if I'm, if I remember and I don't slump over the desk. But, um, is it because it's quite, you seem to be, there seems to be quite a big investment into Magic in order to kind of get anywhere. You either skirt around the sides or you go, kind of like really, really deep into it. And you have to kind of like invest quite a lot of money. Um, I mean, was that, what was your kind of experience of it? I only ever played casual. And right, I, my friends taught me the terminology, but they didn't really teach me much about synergy. And mm -hmm. so if I wanted to have a deck that had good synergy, I wasn't building anything. I was having to go to the store and buy something that was pre-built. Or like you said, I'm going, Yeah. I'm jumping right into it and I'm going to learn all the terminology, all the different kinds of decks, all of the, you know, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to want to play competitive and I'm going to want to get what's modern. And I just, you know, so either you play casual and you just play with what you got or you do the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> and all of my casual friends um, kind of started, you know, having families and doing their lives. So I just kind of, yeah, I lost yeah. the casual players that I was comfortable playing with. And uh, so that's uh -huh. really kind of what happened. I still enjoy playing Magic. I think it's a, f a great game. Yeah. But I, I just prefer casual and I don't have people in my life that will play casual that enjoy it. People that enjoy magic will yeah. not play casual. And people that will play casual typically don't want to play magic, in my experience. Yeah, I kind of find that. It's like the games that I've played, the guys were like really quite serious into it. And then 
it was really difficult for them to kind of hold back on absolutely just going, boosh, 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 you're dead. Yeah. And I'm going like, what? I've just sat down at the table. <laughs> I didn't even know what game we were playing. But, you know, thank you very, very much. I'm off now to reassess my, my kind of my <laughs> life, my life choices. Um, Interestingly, I suppose um, I was mentioning, but um, eBay had a little bit of an issue with um, Hasbro when they released the new decks that came out because um, eBay's stock system um, broke and uh, accidentally um, basically ordered 32,000 um, copies um, or allowed the sale of 32,000 copies of this $249 deck which has just been released and eBay have now had to put through refunds in the region of $7.7 million um, to all these people who went to buy <laughs> to buy Magic. No way! That's a true story. It happened like, yeah. Hasbro, who have a deal with eBay to sell all of this stuff, said, okay, we've got 12,000 units. Um, and eBay processed sales for something about 44,000 units <laughs> and then had to refund every single person. Who, wow. Who, um, yeah, it's not a funny story, but it's kind of like, it is kind of, but you know, it's just one of these things. So it just, it's funny know, for it us. Just further can, well, seven point seven million. I mean, it's <laughs> eBay. They're fine. <laughs> it's it's kind of the whole. I know somebody kind of, but then somebody's kind of went. You imagine the meeting in the office when they went. So, what's the figures, Todd? Because oh, there'd no. be a guy called Todd. <laughs> what's the figures, Todd? It's looking really good. We've done twenty seven thousand units so far. Really? Well, I'll come back to you in an hour. How many units have we done? We've done forty two now. That's brilliant, Todd. How many did we have allocated? <gasps> Twelve. And then he, Todd just runs. Todd's gathering Todd up as much day. magic as he can. <laughs> <laughs> Todd just Todd didn't come back. <laughs> Nobody saw Todd again. Anyway. Um But we take we jump on the train and we go forward through Tricket to Ride. I'm trying to link this desperately <laughs> okay. back to where we are just now. Um did that was that the start of your kind of train journey down the cardboard tracks to have a huge collection of games or are you the type what kind of gamer are you are you the type of person that goes right i want this i want this i want this were you the type of person that was bidding 300 dollars for a copy of wingspan or are you the type of person that goes through kind of are you quite selective in kind of what you want to play and what you have in your collection when I first started getting um, games into my collection, I was looking for ones that looked like maybe they didn't have a mass production, but they were still fun. Mm -hmm. I have always been drawn to smaller scale things and, you know, indie things, indie games, books, movies, music, and I wasn't surprised to that I wanted to find these smaller games. And so that's what my f collection was first made up of. And then it started to be made up of games I was asked to review. So All right, okay. that filled up my collection. And now I've called my collection because my shelf was too packed, couldn't handle all that stuff. I was like <laughs> overwhelmed. It was like I couldn't pick a game. I had too many. So I went through yeah. and um, I've called it pretty well to, I've kept almost all of the prototypes I've ever been sent because those are special to me. Um, yeah. But I've gotten rid of a good amount of, you know, final production copies of games that I just either don't think I'm ever going to open. <laughs> like I've gotten rid of things that I purchase and are still in shrink. Uh, and I'm just like, it's just never going to happen. And I think there's trophy games, isn't there? I think there's games that you think I have to own this game and then you get that game and then that game sits for a while 
and it sits on your shelf or you take the shrink off and you may even open it. You may have a sniff of the glue inside, which, you know, is the is the right of anybody who wants to do that, especially the instruction, especially the big ones. And you're like, oh, it's lovely. But anyway, but then you put it back in the box. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> then you put it back in the box and you put it away and um, and then it just sits there. Now, I've got like the others, the Simon game by Eric Lang sitting on a shelf. It's never been touched. It's not unwrapped. I don't know whether to sell it or whether to keep it because it's a substantial package and whether, I, you know, I've got the shelf space so it's not taking up an awful lot of shelf space but I'm trying to think about games which I'm going to enjoy or I know I enjoy. I mean, do you still have games that you'd like to get to the table in your collection or are you a happy bunny now? Are you sitting there going... Everything that's on this shelf, I've played, I've had an experience, I've got some memories, no? No, I have pulled games off my shelf and made a separate pile for the ones that Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to keep this or get rid of it. So I have an I don't know pile. And um, Mm -hmm. some of the games that are in that pile, like, is role player. I've heard so much, so many good things about role player but I've never played it, so I'm just kind of waiting on it. So is your copy just called Roll, then? (laughs) It's just Player. (laughs) I haven't rolled anything yet. Uh, What's another one in there? fight. (laughs) You're right. Um, What else is in that pile? Oh, uh, Merlin. I haven't played Merlin, but I own it, and... I just want to get it to the table so bad. And Viticulture. I own Viticulture and I've never played it. Get out. <laughs> See, it's in my I don't know yet pile. So well, You have to. No, it has to be in your yes pile. You have to go. Well, I have to play it. I will wait. You w- No, I will wait. You can put it from your maybe pile right right into your yes pile there you go there's a problem solved i've helped you make a decision i'm helping it's a really really good game i've i don't think i've anybody i've not heard of many people that say they don't like it because it's quite relaxing and it's quite fine and you've got these lovely little glass beads and you're making wine and you get big meeples and worker placement and i really really like it um so i would say if I had viticulture in a pile about yes or no, I would probably be putting that in the yes, the yes pile. I'm not trying to influence mm-hmm. you or tell you what to do. I'm just saying. But um, so what kind of games? I mean, you mentioned the smaller games, but are you? I mean, are, are these games coming because of, like they're preview copies, review copies? Are they just kind of games that you've went? I've heard this is good. I'm just going to pick up a copy of it. It's a li- um. You mean in my collection right now? Yes. It's a little bit of both. I have games where I reviewed and I enjoyed them so much that I just still play them. And I have games mm-hmm. that I've, um, like I'll just find on the shelf at the game store. But a lot of the things on my shelf are Kickstarters too. I All right, okay. So I back a lot of Kickstarters, which end up not making it usually to my local game store shelves mm-hmm, just because mm-hmm. just there's too many. Um, so that tends to fill up my shelf and I do. It's hard with those ones because sometimes I'm backing the game because I want to support the designer and or the publisher, but I'm not really yeah. interested in the game. So I get it. And then I'm like, well, I supported them, but now I'm going to give this game to somebody else. So then those ones go into my, Get rid of pile two. Yeah. Yeah. It's really weird because it's like, it's kind of like if I have, there's some games on Kickstarter which I'm going to keep, but there's ones on other Kickstarter that I'm quite happy for other people to kind of experience because I feel I've kind of, it sounds really weird, but I feel like being part of the Kickstarter, going ahead and backing them and supporting them kind of makes me feel like, um, I've kind of supported them, therefore I don't feel as bad 
kind of given the game away. That sounds the strangest logic ever, but you know what I mean? I've kind of, I've already been part of such a journey. And for a lot of people I know, just even taking part in the Kickstarter, they don't really mind about, you know, they get the game and then it's like, well, have you played it? Well, you know, I don't know, the kind of, I guess the hype was there at the time and I'm not kind of, um, you know, I'm not really that fussed whether I play it, I'll just give it away to, to kind of somebody else. Sometimes it's bad, but I'll back a game because I'm just amazed by the artwork. And then when I get the game in, I'm like, oh, why did I back this? I don't like these kinds of games. <laughs> but it's so pretty. So what do you do? I am... Um... <laughs> You could frame the art. Yeah, I've actually get the box. thought about doing something like that or doing some kind of cool, I don't know, something. But then would you take the title off the the front? Would you actually cut the title off or would you have the whole title in there as well? I guess it depends if it fits or not. It depends on the game. Yeah. Yeah, because there's some of them it would fit in the – because I'm thinking of something, say, like – um like viticulture is a kind of a semi nice kind of box, but I wouldn't want the big viticulture word on the top. I'd kind of want to get rid of that and just have the Beth Sabell art kind of underneath instead. I guess. Um, how did you get into the kind of the making things for people to look at when they're considering things to do with board games? This isn't going to work. <laughs> how did I create content? <laughs> No, how did you get involved in it? Yeah, what made you decide? You know what I mean. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start making videos and doing stuff with board games. My first videos were just about random topics in the like geek and nerd culture. Like I have videos mm -hmm. where I'm talking about the difference between the different Star Trek series <laughs> and. When I started getting into board games, what's the worst? What's the no, no, What's the worst Star Trek series then? Mm, that's hard because all. Oh, well, I don't like the original series, so I could say that one's the worst. If we're going with that one, but I'm really. I, 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 yeah, I don't. I kind of. It's really weird because I like Voyager. I didn't like how Voyager ended. It just ends. It's just like, do you know what it is? It ended like Ally McBeal ended, that all of a sudden they couldn't be bothered doing it anymore. So they just decided to bring Jonathan Fraker in and say, it was all a hologram, which is, I believe, how it ended. What did you think of um, Enterprise then, the one with Scott Bakula? I actually haven't seen it. Did you rate that at all? You haven't mm -hmm. seen it? I also haven't seen, um, what's the most recent one, Discovery? Discovery? You haven't seen Discovery? No. Discovery's pretty good. No, I, I liked it. I'm liking it so far. It's a slow burn, but they're trying to take it in a different direction. I kind of like kind of where it is. Um, so the videos that you were making, what did you decide out the ones that you were? What did you think was the best kind of Star Trek then? Um... Well, I didn't talk about like which one was the best one. I was just talking about the different ones and how... Um... Like Voyager is if you're looking for something exp like development of a group of people. And then Deep Space mm -hmm. Nine has a storyline. So if you want a story from beginning to end, you got Deep Space Nine. Mm -hmm. And um, Next Generation is very philosophical. So if you're looking to think about yeah. the way humanity exists. So they're all different. I think it just depends on what kind of mood mm -hmm. you're in. And that's, I think, what my point was is that you can't knock a Star Trek for not being like the other one because I think they all had different purposes. Even though they were in the same, you know, the, it, what's cool is having the same characters like interact on other series. Like I know um, yeah, Riker is in, I think, all of the series. He shows up at some point. He turns up, doesn't he? I know, he kind of got his executive producer trousers on and decided he was just going to turn up in any old spaceship. And they was like, you can't come in, you've not got your beard. You can go away, um, you know, which is all right. No, I just like, I like winding up. There's a person at work who's a 
big Star Trek fan, and I like winding him up by telling him how wonderful I think the latest J.J. Abrahams films are and how they've really done an awful lot um, for the Star Trek franchise. Um, and then he kind of like, he doesn't, he doesn't like that. <laughs> He's not a big, he's not a fan. One can only you know, wonder like why. Well, then Insurrection's rubbish. Oh, yeah. It's a bad, it's a bad film. And then you directly into J.J. Abrahams with his lens flare. You know, it's absolutely fantastic. So you covered Star Trek videos. And then where did you say, actually, I'm surrounded by all these board games. Maybe I should be doing stuff like that. Well, when I was, you know, learning about International Tabletop Day, and I started to learn more about um, these modern games, and I started picking up my own copies of games. I had friends that had their these humongous collections, and I was like, mm-hmm. okay, you have introduced enough games to me. I'm going to introduce some stuff to you, but that means I have mm-hmm. to find things that you don't have. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of where it started, and I would find things on the shelf that I wanted to introduce them, but I'm really visual with my learning. And so I would go to YouTube to find tutorials or reviews and I would either Mm -hmm. not find any or the ones I would find were like really bad. And I just like couldn't follow along or it was just someone rattling off without like a purpose. So I decided to start making them myself kind of in reference and help because I would kind of like reword the rules in a way that made sense to me. And I was like, well, if I'm already doing that, I'll just record myself talking about it and so then i just kept doing another one and another one i had been writing them down i have some written reviews that i've done but like i said i'm, I'm yeah. more visual so i was like well yeah I'll just yeah. start I'm, i was like i said i was already doing these silly videos on about star trek and <laughs> i don't know what else the heck i was talking about i gotta go and see some of those episodes but um i know i used to talk about candy there was one where I was like trying random candies from the store, you know, where they have, they'll have exclusive seasonal candies. I'm like, this one's terrible. Who thought about this? It was great. These are great videos. I should do those again. Yeah. Bacon covered in toffee and things like it's that. It's probably tasty though. <laughs> it's probably amazing. You get like your bacon and you get your toffee. It'd be like chewy. Yeah, but it sounds so bacon. good. Bacon. Sweet and salty. Nom, nom. It sounds like something you would get in after you've had like the worst day and just say, I don't need you. I've got my bacon <laughs> toffee snacks. You know, you just sit down. Put you on, and your dog. Put on deep space. Put on, de- put on deep space. No. Put on deep space nine. Um, you know, my dog's at my work. He's the one that usually causes all the hassles. Um, but yeah. So, so you were like, well, I want to put up kind of playthrough videos and how to play videos on how I would like to learn. Yeah. Um, which is the kind of the direction you kind of went with it. Um, when you're doing stuff like that, are you, do you focus on, do you end up trying to chase the kind of the, the fresh, the exciting and the new? Do you have to kind of stay focused and say, right, I'm just going to do this game and this game and this game? Is there the temptation to go off and kind of like chase the newer kind of games and do videos on them because they will potentially get more kind of visits and more views? No, because everybody's doing it. So I'm just like one voice among a thousand. When I could be Mm -hmm. one voice out of two for an indie game. And yeah. And it's helpful. I mean, am I, if someone has, if it's a hot game and everyone shared their opinion and there are three, four other tutorials, is my video going to make any difference or help anybody that they don't already know? Probably not. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, and uh, I kind of take pride in the organic growth that I've had. My YouTube channel, I did get a big boost actually of help from um, James Hudson. He teamed up with me one time. He was doing a giveaway and he wanted to help boost my follower count. So he helped me a lot. But on 
you know, like mm-hmm, Facebook mm-hmm. and Twitter and Instagram, all of those other things. Um, I'm actually more active on all of those than I am on my YouTube channel just because videos take so much work in, in editing and, you know, yeah, they do. Yeah. But, um, I, like I said, I, I pride myself in my organic growth and that I don't chase those things. I just want to do the things that are helpful and I don't know, indie games don't have a lot of help, I think. So it helps me if it helps me, it's going to help someone else too right yeah 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 when did you um when did you decide to like you could start to kind of like charge people for it so and was that a difficult is that a difficult decision as well because i i couldn't imagine me charging people to coming on the show people have said oh you should and i would say no um i think you'll find that most people that talk to me i would probably have to give them money (laughs) to stay but I mean, did you get to the point where you're like saying, actually, I'm doing so many of these and being asked to do some of these, I should really kind of start asking my time is valuable. I should be asking for money to do it. I, when we were working, we being me and Mike Wocash, who is the owner of the publishing company, Fairway Three Games, him and I joined together mm. to create the Indie Game Report, which is the website where I host mm. all of my YouTube in written content, every all of my stuff. Um, mm-hmm. When him and I first started it, we discussed maybe a Patreon or something of the sort to help generate money because, you know, and for us, the essence of a review is it's unbiased. And to be unbiased, you can't yeah. really charge. So the services yeah. I charge for now are anything where I don't share my opinion. So if you want me to do a tutorial where it's just educational or a walkthrough where it's mm. just like kind of a commercial, I'll charge for something like that. But um, yeah. something where I'm giving my opinion and I can't. But I did start a Patreon um, recently, which was a really hard thing for me to do because I'm very steadfast and not give, being given money. If that makes sense, you know, let me work for my, the, for my money. Um, yeah. And there was a discussion in a board game media creator group. See there media. That's better than content creator, media creator. No, you don't like that one. <laughs> we need to come up with a different word for what we do because media is so, Media sounds to me like I'm a CD-ROM in a plastic case well, that's just been discarded. And you know, what about entertainment? Board. I'm a board game entertainer. But then I have to be funny. You're not. I'm not funny. <laughs> no, nah, not really. You know. Are you entertaining? Well, you're be funny. Well, you can. I. You could be dramatic and entertaining. I'm not gonna dance. <gasps> yeah, just say. Could, yeah. Just say shock a lot. Shocking. I can't believe I can just it. Say this. this is a disgrace. <laughs> this is a disgrace. See? So much more dramatic. This is an actual disgrace. Now you're it is. now you're really becoming an entertainer, I think. I feel I'm moving up to being kind of taken seriously. I think I just, you know. I just wish I'd kind of, you know, worn my better slippers instead of my um my big fluffy animal ones that I'm currently wearing just now. It's fine. But anyway, um, it's okay. Anyway, we digress. Well, I digress. I always digress. It's, you've got I to think keep I it did a, straight and narrow here. I think this time it was my turn to digress. I think we can I, both accept responsibility. So in this in this media group, we were talking about uh, how <laughs> if you're giving an opinion, you know, it's People who are watching this content don't want to know that you've been paid because then they think you're only going to say something nice because this person paid you to give your opinion. And so that's just like a real struggle. So I can't charge for a review. Yet I've heard from some publishers and um, designers that reviewers should be charging or making something for their efforts. So I met myself in the middle and finally said, okay, I'll do this Patreon. Because I don't want to devote all of my time to something where I'm making money. I enjoy doing these things and making videos for people who can't afford them 
or they don't have, like I said, they don't have anything good on YouTube already. So I have to pick and choose though. I'm still gonna, like you said, time, time is valuable and time is money. Exactly. Einstein was wrong. Um, time is money. Um, but also I think if I've seen this argument quite a lot and it seems to be kind of continually coming up again and again and again. And I think that's because to be a, um, a gay of board games almost kind of critic, critique, critiker, critical person, journalist almost, you don't go through some kind of ethical board game journalism course. There's not somebody that sits you aside and said, right, this is correct and this is wrong. So there are still people that I've seen, and you know who you are, um, who go on and say, oh no, getting paid for reviews is completely fine as long as you're declaring that you're getting paid. And it's wrong. No, no, you can't, <laughs> you can't do that. But I always have the view as if, if, <sighs> It's then it's a grey area even if you set up a Patreon because what happens if I set up a Patreon and I'm doing reviews and then next month I notice that one of my huge biggest supporters is a game that I'm about to write a review about. It's a publisher I'm about to write a review about. Do I then declare they're a Patreon? A patron of the us. If I don't declare they're a patron of us and then somebody finds out they're a patron of us, does that mean I've then, comp- you know, I've, uh, you know, I've then, I've then basically knackered myself Mm -hmm. because you know i can't if not declared it it's kind of a it's kind of like a a kind of like a strange a strange thing do you are you still enjoying creating the content as well it ebbs and flows right now i am Mm. but there have been times where i felt burned out and it was just Mm. a chore it wasn't you know right now it's working on things like uh, matryoshka are paid gigs. So those I feel as second yeah. jobs, cause this isn't my main job. I have a, a normal day job where we're, you know, where yeah. I run an office. Um, so this doing the content isn't a second job. It's just a hobby. So sometimes you mm-hmm. have different hobbies and you get burned out with ones and it comes and goes, but right now I'm enjoying this hobby in the moment. Yeah. 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 And I think sometimes um, there will be a time where I will step away from all of this, and I will just go back to playing board games. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna not play board games. I'm not gonna go right. That's it, and throw everything out. I think what I'll do is I'll stop, you know, um, staying up and speaking to people and recording it, and then putting it out there, and that'll stop. But the board game stuff will kind of, kind of continue. Is there more stuff? you would like to do in terms of, I guess, the kind of the media stuff, you know, are are you one of these people that kind of would think, actually, if I did this full time, this would be like really, really kind of cool. Or are you kind of, well, I'm not sure. I'm kind of, I like to have non-reliance on this for my main income. I think I like having a regular day job. Although, Mm-hmm. I would like to be part time. Yes. So, say I, I would prefer f- working four days instead of five, but I do not want yeah. those four days to be working on media. That's it's hard as a freelancer because there's so many benefits wrapped up into having a job for a corporation. Unfortunately, you know when you get health insurance and pay time off and sick leave and. Yeah. You know, there's mm. workers' compensation. If I injure myself, while, if, if a light falls on me while I'm working on a video, that's it. I'm not working yeah. on – no one's, you know, unless I am yeah, making yeah. enough money to cover some kind of special additional insurance to pay for that, I'm going to be in trouble. So I like having yeah. the security, I think, is really what it's about. Okay. okay. If the security okay. was there with the media, though, like if I didn't have this kind of – um life in the United States <laughs> where I worried about my health insurance <laughs> being attached to my career. I think I would enjoy doing it full time though. I have huge opinions about the, <laughs> about the American health thing and I just, I can't because that's an entire podcast it's, in itself and it would just be me by myself kind of shouting like a ranting old man. And the rest of us just going, crying and saying, yes, why? <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Don't get me an ambulance because I can't afford it. And I'm yep. just going, what? I once anyway. passed out. Um, I was getting cra- – it's a silly story. Um, I pass out for anything. I've passed out probably like six or seven times in my adult life. And this one time I passed out was when I was getting my hair done. I had bleach in my hair and I was waiting to get it rinsed out and I passed out. They called an ambulance because I didn't know what the hell was going on. Um, Hmm. They put me in the ambulance and they were like, do you want us to take you to someplace? And I was like, no, you will let me leave this before you drive this thing away. Wow. I was fine, but you it, it like you said, it is a thing. It's definitely a thing. It's like, you know, anyway, moving <laughs> on. Um <laughs> I would cause I would, because I see it and you know, and I've you know, and I've you know, and in you know, and I'm almost out of gas and you don't have a jacket. Um how did you get involved in um dealing with the wonderful and fantastic Dan? Letterman games. How did that? Because we're, as you can see, we're slowly building up like a doll. A doll. <gasps> this is with layers. Um, you know, it's almost <laughs> this entire episode has been. We're almost to the middle. This whole entire. It's it's like a whole huge massive podcast. We're uh, almost to the uh, bacon uh, of the bacon toffee <laughs> snack. <laughs> Let's not do that again. <laughs> But anyway, um, Letterman Games, Dan, um, how'd you get involved? Dan has made content for the Indie Game Report before, and that's where we first met. Um, Mm -hmm. Mike invited him to join. Uh, They knew each other, and that's how Dan and I met through the Indie Game Report. And over the years, I've wanted to learn more about the publishing side of the industry and having that connection. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been trying to find a way where I could work with him or learn from him in some way, but it never worked out. Like the times when I was burned out or the times when he was like, I'm launching, you want to help? I'm like, nope. (laughs) Or he's got nothing going on. And I'm like, Hey, I'm feeling good. You got any projects you're working on? And he's like, not really. So it just never time like the timing was never right. Um, but so I love foreign languages and I love, I've been learning Dutch and I've been wanting to find a way to like incorporate my enjoyment of foreign languages with board games. Yeah. And the localizing games has become for small publishers has become more popular lately. And I was thinking, you know what? If, if this is something that a publisher I'm comfortable with working with would be interested in. Maybe I could run a localization project because then I can work with, you know, learning foreign languages or, you know, Mm -hmm. foreign Mm -hmm. companies. And Dan was the first person I approached and he said, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. So I didn't have to ask anybody else. It worked out that way. And like I said, we've been trying to find a way for us to like, for me to learn the publishing aspect of it. And it just never, the timing didn't work. So this worked out great. And I had played Matryoshka, Matroshka, Matroshka. I don't know. However, you you pronounce it in your country. I I call it tomato. <laughs> tomato, tomato, Matroshka. Matroshka, Matroshka. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had played it Eventually. before. <laughs> yeah, right. I had played it before, back even before I was making video content. When I was doing written content, I received it to mm. review and I loved it. But nobody heard about the game. It wasn't really well available in the United States. And so that game has stuck with me over the years. And so that's the game I first brought to Dan. And we mm-hmm. tried a couple of other games as well. But we kept coming back to that one. And we asked White Goblin Games, who was the original publisher... Um, they're based out of the Netherlands if they had the rights available and they didn't at first, but there's uh, a couple weeks went by and they worked something out and we were able to obtain the rights to localize it in both the United States and in Canada. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, Dan basically said, since you brought this idea to me, this is your project. You're, manage the project and i was like yes please i want to manage the project this is kind of 
But he's also like held my hand through it. You know, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. You need to tell me who to contact. I need to know, like, yeah. I don't know the difference between white core and black core because I've always been a backer. I've never been a someone that had to get quotes yeah, no. for different GSM paper qualities before, you know? So I've learned a lot with working with him and we've already been talking about the next campaign, how much more confident I feel I'll be in being able to do something on my own. Does it, um, in terms of like the services that you offer then, does that open up you to then say, oh, I can actually help other people with this? If we go down this road of conversation and people kind of ask, you don't suppose you happen to know anybody who can, you can say, yeah, that's, I can definitely do that for you. That's a fee kind of thing. For sure. What my main goal is right now is to obtain enough work where I can get my day job down to four days. Um, because mm -hmm. if I have four days, I still can maintain my American benefits. <laughs> and so if I can get enough work, I can't believe you're going back there again. <laughs> um, if I can get enough work to fill in that time, I'd love to, because I'm, mm. this is a, while I am the localization manager for him, we're still a small company. And so it's a freelance position. So I can freelance yeah. and help other companies while he's doing other projects because he also has in-house designs that he's developing and publishing. So those are going to yeah. take precedence for a while. And, you know, so once I'm kind of released of Matroska, I'm going to be totally open to taking on other localization projects. That's not an advert. It sounds like an advert. <laughs> it could be an advert. It is an advert, <laughs> but it's fine. Should I drop my email address here? <laughs> No, you can do that at the end. Um. Tune in later. <laughs> does but then does that does that then have you thinking about kind of game design yourself? Then I have designed a game actually. I wanted to design a game for a while. After reviewing for so long, hmm. you think I think I have a good idea of what a good and a bad game is. <laughs> uh, so I think I could maybe yeah. do one of these things. But I never had any kind of direction, so I never pursued it. Yeah. But there was a, right. a contest called the Gen Can't Contest. So everyone that cannot attend Gen Con uh, yes. attends Gen Can't. Yes. It's very, very clever. Mm -hmm. And they hosted a contest for an 18-card game design. And I submitted I, – I decided to use that as my parameters to design a game. So I designed a game. It's called – Wizard mm. Shelf. Mm. I submitted Wizard Shelf. It did not win, but it did get signed by a publisher after. So I have my game going to Kickstarter in the fall by the publisher. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Publisher is Concrete Canoe Games, and um, it's going to be this little 18-card game in a little hook box. And that's what my publisher does is little 18-card hook box games. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that... It's like Button Shy does. Is it Button Shy do a lot of them, I believe? Yeah, they do theirs in the wallets. And um, hmm. this is through the Game Crafter website. Right. They have these new boxes. Hmm. Um, I think they're fair, they're newish. Uh, maybe in the last year they've had them. And they're hook box games. They're great. They're cute little boxes. You can you know throw them in your wallet in your pocket. And um, so my publisher wanted to do something with these boxes. So that's what he's done. And he found my game and he played it. And he said, can I sign it? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I've designed one game, but I have more on the horizon. I guess what I really should be asking is, with this Kickstarter campaign coming out, what can people expect when, when they do play Matryoshka? They can expect to need at least three players. And they can mm -hmm. only play up to five, three to five players. Plays in about 20 mm -hmm. to 30 minutes. Okay. And it's a set collecting and secret trading game. All right. You have a hand of cards of the different dolls. There's different colored dolls and different sizes. So you'll have um, like numbered one through seven of the same kind of doll, but it's like, you know, the small little one, you know, our fake out doll mm -hmm. that doesn't open. To the big seven that can hold everybody. <laughs> and you're trading the dolls back and forth, 
trying to collect as many as you can of this from the same doll and as many as you can yeah. of the same size from different dolls. Oh. So if you can get all of the fives, then that's worth points yeah. as well as getting like one through seven of another doll too. Just fairly simple, fairly straightforward and will no doubt be extremely fun. I for, I don't know for whatever reason why I'm, I'm feeling donuts for uh, go nuts for donuts but that's probably because that has sex set uh, collection in it but also I could really go a donut I kind of want one too <laughs> moment, I want a jelly donut really nice nah it's have to be a gluten free one oh, I'm so- see that's where it gets difficult I just can't run out and get a donut it's just first world problem <laughs> um, have you got have you got prices for how much is entry is going to be on the door to enjoy? Matryoshka? Yes. Not donuts. I'm not asking you for the How much a donut? Donuts. How much is the... <laughs> how much is donut? Probably about, it's going to be... About $100. Oh, my. <laughs> it's going to be 16 US dollars. Uh, free right, free okay. shipping in the United States. And... Um, okay. Subsidized shipping for Canada. And then we're going to have a deluxe version as well, which contains, we um, hired four artists to design four new dolls for the game. And the four artists made, so we have four new complete sets of dolls that players can use in exchange for the existing sets. It doesn't matter which ones. Oh, cool. Yeah. It doesn't matter which yeah, ones you yeah. use. Um, so as long as you use one through seven of a doll. And so, and we're also going to have in the deluxe, it's going to have two wooden meeples. So you can track who's the active player and who started the round. Cool. And that is $24. That's still very, very little compared to the horror stories that I'm currently seeing on Kickstarter. Yes, it's. And the amount of money that they're asking for. It's affordable, but it's also, I mean, it's just cars. So we're not, yeah. we don't have a ton of components that would make it expensive. So thank, thankfully. No, that's going to be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and if people want to get in on that doll type action, that's the wrong thing to say. <laughs> but if they want to get involved, <laughs> where can they find out more information? Where do you all exist? On the internet webs. I would go to lettermangames.com. That's where you can find mm-hmm. information out about the Kickstarter. And if you just want quick information about what the game is about in general, before you go and look at the Kickstarter mm-hmm. and see the pricing and whatnot. Cool. And what about your good self? Where do you exist on the internet webs? Um, I have my content at the Indie Game Reports website, indiegamereport.com. But I also have my mm-hmm. own website where I, if you want to hire me for services or if you want to see to, or not tutorials, um, what's the word? Um, when someone says something nice about the work you've done, what, what is that? Testimonial. My, my nice feedback. Testimonial. Thank you. Testimonial. My testimonials are there. I have them. They exist. I didn't make them up just now right here in this podcast. <laughs> It is at my website, CassieL.com. That's good. I don't think anyone noticed that, but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, it's fine. Um, you're on Twitter as well. I am, yes. My Twitter handle is at Friedman Cassie, which is my legal name. There you go. Yeah, my, oh. Cassie L is my secret pen name. Want to know why? That's your, uh, yeah. My middle name is Lynn. So the middle initial is uh, L. So it's Cassie L. I know, so smart. <laughs> Mind blown. I know. Mine's absolutely blown. <laughs> absolutely blown. Um, we'll make sure that we put all of these links in the show notes so that we've got notes to show. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on. Thanks for having um, me on. This is probably this has probably not been the conversation. You expected it was totally to fine. Have. We, we covered donuts. <laughs> I mean, 
what else? Medical health. <laughs> Unfor- Kickstarters, unfortunate. Paid reviews. <laughs> You know, testimonials. Passing well, eventually, out from bleach, testimonials. you know. Yeah, just the whole, the range of topics and a smorgasbord. And remember toffee mm-hmm. bacon. And Star Trek. <laughs> Star Trek as well. Um, and if you want to keep an eye on other things that we're up to, if you go to um, the internet webs, if you search for We're Not Wizards, you'll find us on Twitter. You'll find us on Instagram. You'll find us on Facebook. You'll find us on our website, which is we're not wizards.com. You'll find us on our blog, which is we're not wizards.blogspot.com. You'll, uh, you can email us, which is magic at we're not wizards. Yes, I am aware of the irony of the email address. It's why I picked it. You don't have to keep pointing it out. Um, if you like what you've listened and you want to continue to catch us on the podcast catchers that can catch podcasts that catch things that are out there, just go and search for them. They've all got pod or the cast in them, <laughs> except for Spotify, which has neither because it likes to be different and sometimes difficult. Um, if you like what you've listened to tonight, there's a couple of ways you can support us. Um, you can go to tell somebody. That's the first thing. Just say, oi, you. Man at bus stop when I listen to a podcast. <laughs> listen to this podcast. And that's how you spread us like a terrible viral cold, cold going about the place. If you throw things um, at people, just like make sure it's a nice snack. <laughs> like here's a, del- a delicious snack. You should listen to the podcast <laughs> that I've branded upon the snack. That's potentially going to work. Um, toffee bacon flavored podcasts. <laughs> Um, that's what that's our tagline. Um, oh, there th- I mean, we've got things like Patreon, but don't do that because that's silly. Um, but you can also uh, go to Apple Podcasts and uh, you can give us a rating or a review. A subscription's really nice, but a rating or review is really nicer. If you want to give us a rating or review, don't give us ten stars because it makes us big headed. But don't give us one star because it makes us cry. <laughs> give us something in the middle. Like a five. That's exactly in the middle. Because it's average. And we're just a little bit average. But the person who's not been average is a rather wonderful, rather fantastic Cassie L. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. There's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Cassie? We're not wizards. No, of course we're not. We are M... Um, <laughs> Beautiful hand painted wooden dolls. I'm a witch. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> and on the other thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Cassie. So say goodbye, Cassie. Goodbye, Cassie. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, and make something awful. But until the next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Wizard is never late. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to.